um, for, board, for Board of Education has three parts to it. Uh, the first part are, is the opening statements. Each candidate will have two minutes. The candidates are, to my immediate left, Mrs. Wilma Campbell. To her immediate left, Mrs. Deborah Clark. To her immediate left, Mr. Richard Lear. To his immediate left, Mrs. Annabelle Melgar. To her immediate left, Mr. Frederick Moore Sr. And to his immediate left, Mr. David Rutherford. Now we drew ballot, uh, positions for opening statements and Mrs. Melgar came in first, so she will make the first opening statement of two minutes. Um, the timekeeper has two cards, a yellow card, which will mean that you have 30 seconds left to respond, and then the red card means you need to stop, but you may finish your thought. doing the uh, fourth ward uh, debate this evening. Um, is uh, Mrs. Rivers here? Okay, you can come to the table. Okay. The reason for that is uh, Mrs. Rivera is ill and is unable to make it, and based on the policy, we don't have a debate if there's... education is so vicious. Despite this, these attacks, I believe we can continue to improve our schools locally, and I want to contribute what I can to these efforts. Uh, it's in the best interest of the school board to have an architect like myself that can look at many capital improvement projects in the pipeline through the, for the district's best interest. I also have the perspective of having taught in another system in France. I don't claim to have all the answers. I don't think anyone has all the answers. And the jobs and duties of a school board are very complex. 
but I assure you that I have the best of intentions, that I have a love for the city of Plainfield. I now have friends from all around the world, and they know where I'm from. Uh, I don't mean the U.S. or New Jersey. I mean Plainfield. People that know me also know how hard of a worker I am, how seriously I take commitment and service, and that I'll stand up for my beliefs, some of which are a quality education for all. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Moore. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, at this time, I'd like to thank the, thank the League of Women Voters for inviting us to this forum. I have worked in education for the past 47 years in, in urban education specifically. With the experiences that I've had in the classroom, as a classroom teacher, as a dean of students, and a coach, during these years, I have uh, come to be able to address some of the academic and social problems that students have. And we all understand that many of the outside influences have both positive and negative impact on the academic and social, their academic and social, social success. The students that we educate must be afforded all tools necessary to allow them to reach their maximum potential. I have a an interest, an extra interest also, because I have a granddaughter who is in the seventh grade at the Cedar Brook School. So with the expertise that I've been able to gather over all of these years, I think that I am uh, one of those qualified beings to be elected for the Plainfield Board of Education, along with David and Wilma. I thank you very much. Thank you. Mrs. Clark. Good evening. My name is Deborah Clark, and I'm running for the Board of Education. I am a product of Plainfield School System. My children attended Plainfield Schools. My grandchildren are now in the system. My grandchildren are not receiving the quality of education that I received when I decided, that's why I decided to run for the Board of Education. My mission is to work with the Board and the Administration to provide a more challenging or comprehensive curriculum for all our students. I want, to, I want to assure that all students in Plainfield have the opportunity to graduate from high school and be prepared to go to work or college of their choice. When our, when our students earn a degree from Plainfield High School, it will enable them to, to new responsibilities and become teachers and entrepreneurs and business owners, executive and elected, and elected leaders as yourselves. In order for the student to get the education they deserve, we need dedicated and caring board members, administrators, that will use the resources wisely and efficiently. I would like every school's mission to not only enrich the minds of the children, but also develop their character through mentorship and community involvement. That's why I need your vote and your support. For me and my running mates, Annabella, Annabella Melgar, Richard Lear, and myself, Deborah Clark. So please go to the voting line and vote one, four, and six. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Campbell. Good evening, and welcome to what is an opportunity for you to find out what the school district is all about and what the board members are supposed to do. I thank the League of Women Voters for setting this up. It's always a wonderful opportunity to come and boast of the many things that our school district, our present school board, is doing. I'm grateful, very grateful, to have the opportunity to serve as a board member, and I'm pleased to say that I am part of a board that is collaborative, engaged, and very committed to the students of this district. I do not come with a singular interest. I come with an interest that all 8,000 students in this district are fully served. I think it's important that we put the priority of excellence at the very top of the list and political maneuvering to the side. Our team is very devoted to educating our children and educating them to the point that they will be competitive and able to compete with students from all over the country, not our closest neighbors, but across the entire country. 
We've made strides. We have increased enrollment. We have increased graduation rates. We have the largest graduating class this past year that we've seen in over 10 years. We are engaged, and for that, we came and we did what we said we would do, and we want to continue doing even more. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lear. Hello, my name is Richard Lear. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here, the opportunity to speak. I'm a member of the Van Wyck Brooks Historic District, and in 2012 and in 2013, we decided to give a scholarship to Plainfield High School students. I was on the committee. When we received the packets from these children, I was rather alarmed for the fact that these children were bright, you could tell by their essays, but they weren't capable of forming a complete essay. Then I looked at their SAT scores. One of the students had a 4.5 GPA. She had done applied courses through her entire high school career and was ranked in the very top of her class, and her SAT score the third time she took it was 1310, over 200 points below average for the state of New Jersey. Now, there are studies done that say that African American and Latino children don't fare well in standardized tests, but one would think that if you had taken applied courses through your entire high school career, they would at least score average. Then I met these children, and they were intelligent, they were smart, they were bright, they had a fire inside, and it made me angry that they didn't get the education they deserve. From there, I learned that our district is ranked 529th out of 558 districts in the state of New Jersey. Our high school is ranked last in Union County. The state has what they call priority or focus schools, which are the bottom 5% in the state, and they monitor these schools for three years. If the district has done nothing to improve this, they step in, and we had four last year, and this year we have six. Our board has allowed our schools to decrease by 50%. I, I don't find this acceptable in any way, and all of this drove me to run for the board. If you elect me, Richard Lear, Deborah Clark, and Annabella Melgar, we will work diligently to pull our schools out of the bottom of playing field. Thank you. Now into the second portion of the uh, program, and that is your questions. Um, because, because we're interested in issues rather than in personalities, your questions should be confined to the issues. Um, you may address your questions to a specific candidate or generally to all candidates, but all candidates will have the opportunity to uh, respond. If you need an index card, just raise your hand and somebody will be around and give you one. Or if you want to turn in a question, do the, just raise the card and an usher will come to your seat at the same time. Okay. The candidates will have one minute to respond to the questions that are coming in. Uh, they're going to be asked in rotate one order. And the first question, and uh, Mrs. Campbell, you'll be answering this one first, asks, Plainfield had a high, high, uh, highly rated school system and sports program. Both have fallen into hard times. How do you explain this, and how would you fix it? Plainfield students are comprised of uh, some very important numbers that we look at when we talk about student performance. 85% of our students are on free and reduced lunch. We have 28 different dialects here in the district. 17% of our students are receiving special services. So when you look at those particular statistics, it takes, it takes special programs to increase or improve those circumstances. What we have put in place in terms of special academic programs and those programs contoured towards those particular problems, those particular issues, those particular kinds of profiles are in place. And we are evaluating them as we go along. The process is in place. We are moving in the right direction. We have worked to make sure that we have corrected and addressed these problems, and we're improving. We're improving student performance. Thank you. Mrs. 
Clark. Do you need the question repeated? No, it, I'm sorry. We do. I, I make the order as to who's answering the question. Oh. Uh, you want to pass on your turn? Oh, okay. Well, then, Mr. Leo, you're going third. <laughs> According to the information I found, Plainfield High School is made up of 45% Latino or school system, 45% Latino, 50% African American, and 5% other. 63% um, are on uh, the lunch program. The, the, the reality is, our, our schools need a major overhaul. The way we're going we're gonna to correct this is we're going to start at the top of the administration. Teachers have three years to be given correct evaluations so that, so that they're headed in the right direction, so that they do good work in the classroom. Our administrators are responsible for this. That's how we'll correct our problems. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Melbourne. ways and means that we have uh, to uh, improve our, I'll start with the athletic program. We, we, we're going to have to meld both the early, early learning programs, such as the Little League program, and merge those programs, not merge them, but coordinate them with the high school programs uh, so that we can get a better product. We also have to make sure that our, our coaches are going to clinics and meeting those particular needs so that they can be up to date with all of the, the, the nuances in we're in football season, so football for example. Academically we have put in place a lot of the tutorial and remedial programs that are necessary for these students to improve. Students are coming to us with, with academic problems and we are working toward improving them now. Thank you. Mr. Rutherford. As Mr. Moore and Mrs. Campbell have said, um, I don't think that we necessarily need an entire overhaul of the system. Um, we're moving in the right direction already. And um, there's, there's a lot of factors that affect both teacher and student performance, um, support from administration, and so forth. And I believe we can tweak those things, um, as already been stated. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, rebuttal? Rebuttal. Anybody? Rebuttal? 30 seconds for rebuttal and then just the red card goes up after 30 seconds. We cannot ignore the fact that we have seen bumps in our test scores. We have seen improvements to the likes of 20 and 30 points per area in ELA as well as math. We have a student who is in the top 3% of the country on the SAT scores, so all is not as dismal as it is portrayed. Anybody? When we, when we look at scores, we have to understand certain things. We have a, a mixed population, and you have to understand the fact that all of the test scores are melded into one to give you one specific number. So, a certain group of individuals who are not adept in certain things will automatically bring the test scores down, or, okay. or the results down. So Thank, you. Thank you, Mr. Moore. You only have 30 seconds. Anybody else rebutting, Mr. Weir? According to the state of New Jersey, our system is, our high school is 41% proficient in math and 18% proficient in biology. I don't think that your ethnicity is any determination of what you deserve to learn. I don't think that anyone, I'm finished, I guess. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, 30 seconds closed very quickly. Okay, um, next question is, how many uh, school board meetings have you attended in this last year? And Mrs. Clark, you go first. I have attended one for this year. Uh, Mr. Rutherford. I have attended seven. Mrs. Melgar. 
I haven't attended any, no, but I'm planning to I'm planning to to attend. Mrs. Campbell. I stopped counting at twenty. Uh, Mr. Weir. I have not had the opportunity. I was checking the website for the dates that they were available. Unfortunately, the website didn't have a year out in advance. And at this time, my schedule has been very busy. I've been trying to clear it, so I had this opportunity to run for the board and to be available and selected. And okay, that was, now we still have Mr. Moore has to answer this. I've attended each one since the last election. Okay. Uh, I just want to clarify that seven business meetings, the number is higher if you account the agenda for concessions. Thank you. I would like to remind the public that the meetings are posted on the website and it is the tradition as long as I've ever known that meetings are the first and the third Tuesday of each month. Thank you. The next question number three. What are you going to do about the rezoning? All the schools are overcrowded. Um, the kindergarten classes have 26 students or more. And Mr. Moore, you get to answer that question first about rezoning the schools due to overcrowding. One of the things that we have to do is we have to, to uh, deal with the, with the study and make sure that the students who are living in a specific district are going to school in that specific area. We have a policy now where students can live in one area and after October 15th they can transfer whatever school they want to. We have to fix that. Mr. Lear. I don't have any background in zoning. I think the smartest thing to do is to look at the school districts that have had this issue in the past, that are doing successfully now, and see what they've done to improve upon what they did, and then apply those that apply to Plainfield, that apply to our demographics, and that work for our system. Mrs. Campbell. The school district is currently in the process of conducting a rezoning assessment, the results of which have not been provided as yet, but this is a, an issue that has been studied over the past uh, six months to the year, and we should be looking for the results to come out shortly. I wouldn't expect that, let's just face it, there's the dream team and there's the green team. The green team would not have a clue about such an issue because they're not engaged in the school district. Let's just put it out there as it is. Mr. Rutherford. I don't have anything to add. Uh, Mrs. Melbar. I will, I will look into that and investigate because I don't have uh, the answer. Mrs. Clark. I am, I am from Alabama. I don't have the answer for that question, but I'm looking to it. Any rebuttal on this question? No? Okay. Okay. Um, I just want to say thank you very much for all your questions, but we're going to put a hold to the questions. I have more than enough to cover. Um, the time allotment that we have for this evening. So we're moving on to the next question, and that is, um, what are the three to five strengths or accomplishments of the district besides its students, teachers, and families? And Mr. Rutherford, you get to go first. Yes. What are between three and five strengths or accomplishments of the school district? over the past year uh, exclude student teachers and families exclude excluding them is a strength yeah, oh, okay. All right. um, one of 
one of the strengths um, of the last year, and before the last year, is the building of a true project-based learning program, uh, specifically in the Office of Early Childhood under Evelyn Motley. Um, project-based learning means learning by doing. It's turning students from regurgitators from um, learning something on Friday, memorizing it for Monday, and then forgetting it not long after, into creators. And it's proven that through the creative process, students actually do better on standardized testing. So you don't have to teach to the test. All the new research shows that creation is the way students should learn, and I'm happy the board is making progress on that front. Mr. Moore. We have moved to, toward uh, an educational process where, again, the students are no longer regurgitating information, but they're able to, they're able to deal with analytical learning. They're dealing with holistic education, crossing all subject areas, and they're, they're then able to grasp a little bit more. They're able to understand a little bit more. This is Mel Bart. I, I know about the Montessori school. Have you hear, hear about it? That they, they let the they let the children to create or, or work with um, with um, things that they can, you know, they can learn and be capable of. So we 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 are gonna do our best to improve all that in this in the system. Mr. Lear. I would say that project-based learning is a great a great thing that we have going for this town. I think the other thing that that we have are actually the children of this town. When I met with these kids, they were bright, they were intelligent, they have all very strong will to learn, and they want a great future. I think that that's one of the most important things this school has. Mrs. Clark. One of the greatest strengths that we have right in our great community is um, a diverse community, and we also have the potential and the ability to aim higher. One of the facts that we can all uh, relate to is the fact that a couple of years ago, the school board received a CUSAC rating of 11. We've been providing good governance. As a result of that, this board, the current sitting board, was able to rise to a rating of the high 80s. So, I think that because of the good governance, the kinds of things we talk about doing, we've been able to initiate them, implement them, and see the results of our success. Okay, next question. What will you do to get parents more involved with their children's education, and how will you overcome challenges such as language barriers, single parent families, working two jobs to make ends meet. And Mr. Lear, you get to go first. Could you reiterate it, please? Yes. What will you do to get parents more involved with their children's education? And how will you overcome challenges such as language barriers and single parent families working two jobs to make ends meet? Um, there are programs that are available. Um, there's a school system in Delaware that they do, they started with uh, kindergarten, then the next year first grade, and then second grade, and so on, where half the day was English and half the day was Spanish. Um, this is a program I've been looking into, that it could be a, an applicable program because the demographic in the town of Delaware is the same demographic as Plainfield. Um, I think that that would be one track that children could be in which would help promote their education as far as getting the parents involved. I think creating a bridge between the school system and the parents is the first way to go. Mrs. Melgar. Um, we can create a new pro programs for, for the children and um, 
also it's a good idea for me if we get in touch with the parents, like person to person, because sometimes um, they don't have the uh, access or they don't know how to get to into, you know, into, uh, or sometimes they just, um, how can I say, they pass and they don't, uh, don't get interested in, in the children. So um, maybe we can do something with the parents because sometimes we are clo very close society, but when we open to, to the public, and like I said, person to person, that would be nice. This is Clark. First, you have to draw a line of communication between the parents and the teachers. If you can get that done, we can get our district the way how we can how we would like it to be by fostering and parent teacher interaction, which will lead the um, students to better grades and our students of good success. Well, first, the person who asked that question should have been at our back to school programs that first, just completed last that week. Should have been we been had standing room only program. in many of the different schools. We had a back to school program at Woodland School where we had over 500 people to attend, parents and families. We also have some other things that we can still do. We have a homeless population. We need to do some special kinds of things with our homeless population. And grandparents, a lot of grandparents are raising our children. So we've got to bring the mountain to Moses, and we've got to go more into the community. Mr. Moore. And we've got to go more into the community. The perennial problem with uh, PTAs and, and uh, schools is that perennial, yes, the parents have to work and they do all of those things, but schools, the basic thing that has to happen is that they have to feel that ease. They have to feel as though there is not an adversary that has to happen so that they can, they can come in. And when there are language differences, which there are, we have to make sure that there's interpretation, there's, there's, there's the, the language piece so that the culture is mixed so that we can have a better situation. Mr. Rutherford. Uh, one of my idols in education is Jonathan Kozel, um, who, who says every year that he taught, he went to every student's house. Now, the school district of Toronto took this concept and they started doing community walks where they walked around through the communities and not only did they get a better rapport with, with the students and their families, but uh, these were all types, these were administrators, teachers, everyone. Not only did that happen, but they also got teachers to organically tweak their curriculum to better suit the environment of their students. So it was good on both ends and uh, that's the type of idea that I like. Question. Here it says the school, the school board has a budget in excess of um, $100,000, and I'm sure it's, I guarantee it's a lot higher than that. Um, the main question is what experience or qualifications do you have with analyzing a budget of that size or even larger? And Mrs. Melbourne, you go first. Can you please repeat the... Yes. Um, the school board has a budget in excess of $100,000, um, which is low. I, mean, I think your school board budget is a lot higher than that. But the question is, what experience or qualifications do you have with analyzing a budget of that size or larger? Um, I think... Uh, um, as a team, we can work with that and, uh, and investigate or uh, get into that to to be wise and, and to uh, to know how to how to decide 
as a team. Besides having served on the board for the past nine years, I also was an administrator in higher education. Through that experience, I had the opportunity to not only analyze, but to manage budgets upwards of hundreds of thousands of dollars for a long, uh, quite a long period of time. So my expertise, I would say, my background, my work experience, as well as the nine years that I've served on the board. Thank you. During the past year, I've worked uh, with uh, board members and uh, I have learned much about uh, managing uh, large, large amounts of, of money. It's $100,000 is not, uh, that's, I guess that's just a, a ballpark figure. But uh, I've had experience during the past year of working with them. Uh, Thank you. This is Clark. The school, the school board has a budget in excess of, let's say, $100,000. What experience or qualifications do you have with analyzing a budget of that size? First of all, uh, dealing with the um, school budget, the superintendent, you have to go with the superintendent and she spends the money. And our job as a board member would be only to have the policies, make sure they go out, and make sure they um, evaluate. And I have the experience in budgeting money, etc. Thank you. I know that voice anywhere. Mr. Rutherford. Okay. Yeah, Mrs. Clark, can you repeat the last part of your statement? We will work with the board. With the board. Also, when it comes to the budget, um, the Board of Education adopt policy that's under the school district operator and it operates that way with the superintendent. And we will work with the superintendent to budget everything that have to do with the school needs. Mr. Rutherford. Uh, as an architect, everything's about the budget. I meet with contractors and clients every day. We move a steel beam here, and it has $10,000 to the cost. You have to keep it low enough. Um, where I work, they do a lot of design build. Um, the budget is really, everything has to work within the budget. And the projects I'm working on now are all between two and five million dollar jobs. And uh, the budget is in. I worked for Citibank for a period of time, and I was in charge of tracking a $500 million budget. In addition to that, I organize a scuba diving trip once a year that goes to some place in the world, and I'm responsible for about 54 different people's money that is going to the organization that we're going to and handling all of this. Besides that point, the reality is, according to the New Jersey uh, School Board Association, our job is to adopt policies, to oversee the budget. I don't think that we're analyzing the budget. We're overseeing that the money is spent appropriately. question. Knowing that the staff is working without a current contract um, is subject to low morale, um, which negatively impacts our students, what would you do to make sure staff has contracts, they get regular pay raises like other neighboring school districts and are paid fairly? And Mrs. Clark, you get to answer that first. Repeat the question. Yes. Okay. Um, the staff is currently working without a contract and that subjects them to low morale, which negatively impacts students. What would you do to make sure the staff has contracts, that they're paid fairly, get regular pay raises like other neighboring school districts? I don't have to answer that question. Okay, she's passing I don't right have now. an answer for that question. 
Mr. Rutherford. I'm an advocate for the profession of teaching, and I'm, of course I believe that teachers in this district and any district do deserve regular pay raises. Um, there is a budget, and you have to negotiate uh, a contract. Um, but yes, teachers do deserve pay raises. That's the question. Mr. Moore. I just left the meeting the other night at 345 uh, talking about the same thing. One of the things that uh, we all have to realize is that there, in the state of New Jersey, the ceiling amount of money that uh, can be negotiated for is a 2% increase. Those are some of the constraints under which we have to work. Mr. Lear. This is actually a question I have myself. On Monday night, the teachers were picketing outside of Plainfield High School. I would think that that would severely hurt the morale of the students. From my understanding, there is a 2% raise in the budget for the teachers, but the contract expired on June of 2012. Um, I read that the teachers have been without a contract for two years, and I don't really understand how that works if it expired on June of 2012. But you can't put off someone's money. When, when you are working, you deserve a raise. If you deserve a raise, that raise has to be given. You can't drag your feet on it, and that's what the board has done. Mrs. Campbell. I'm glad to hear Mr. Lear does his research, but in the real world of what's going on with the district, there's a negotiating team. And there's a negotiating team that consists of two sides. One side is for the district, one side for the employees. What I've encouraged both members to do is negotiate and come out with a win-win for everybody. Mrs. Melbar. Um, the t-shirts. They are the one who are I believe that uh, if we want to have happy teachers, uh, we have to negotiate or evaluate um, the contract. Because I know there are, there are many teachers that they love to teach. And, okay, and uh, they deserve to get well paid. I've been on the board of five committees for the professional union, SAG, equity, AFTRA, etc. And negotiation is a skill. As we all know, our government hasn't done it well. They shut the government down. Clearly, there is no negotiation going on if they've been sitting without a contract. You have to negotiate, and it's not happening for our teachers. Mr. Moore. To be understood, negotiation is a two-part deal. Both parties have to negotiate. If one party refuses to negotiate absolutely in good faith, there's a problem. Okay. Next question. Our schools rank 529th out of 558, so we clearly need a change. What would you do to increase our ranking, Mr. Moore? Well, what we are doing presently is that we are upgrading the, the math curriculum. We're upgrading the English curriculum also. But the, 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 the pieces that are, that are absolutely necessary in math are all dealing with, with analytical thinking. We are sending our educators to various clinics, if you will, for the lack of a better word, so that they can upgrade their understanding of what's happening. We're also dealing with the students who, who make the grade and the ones who do not make the grade. The ones who do not make the grade because of the, the teaching pattern are educated in addition to the time 
that they, they have in, on that specific subject area. Mr. Mrs. Clark. To move it from 529 to 529 further up, we don't want it further down. Um, smaller classrooms would be appropriate. Um, equip our teachers better, get them more and more books, more information for the students. Um, get, uh, make sure, make sure we evaluate our super, our superintendents and even board members. Make sure they evaluate efficiently. Repeat the question, please. Yes, our schools rank 529th out of 558. So we clearly need a change. What would you do to increase our ranking? First, I do not buy those numbers that's dated information. If you Google it, it's on the New Jersey report cards with dated information from 2006. That's first. But if we are not number one, I would continue to offer what we've done with the tutoring for all which is a program opened up to all of the students, not only the students who are in the free and reduced lunch programs or who are high-risk students, but a program of tutoring that we've opened to all of our students. I just wish that the misinformation that is surfacing around here would not become the Bible because it's not factual. 529 is not the rating, the listing, for 2012. That is not accurate information. Could you tell us what it is? Um, next question, next questioner is uh, Mr. Lear. I highly encourage you to go to the, the New Jersey report card. This is a page from it right here. In 2010, we were 62% math proficient. In 2011, we were 46% math proficient. In 2012, we were 41% math proficient. You don't have to be a mathematician to see that those numbers are falling. This is not, un these facts are facts. I'm pulling these from resources that are, are, are very accreditable. Um, we have to start at the top. It starts with administration, it starts with our superintendent, and we work our way down. Things don't go from the bottom up. These children aren't getting a bad education because the teachers don't want to give them a bad education. There is, they're, they're not giving the resources to the teachers. They're not giving the children what they need. The board is not doing their job. Mr. Rutherford. I'm going to pass on this question. Mrs. Melgar. When I was reading that 529 and 558, that's terrible. And, uh, but we can increase it or we can work because we have been working, Richard and Deborah together, and we have the passion to work into that, even though we don't know everything. But, you know, we have, we, we are willing to work. I know he works so much, and she does, and myself, we have a busy schedule, but I'm making it a space because we, we want to be acceptable when we see that. But we want to work with a passion. Update your data. The graduation rate for 2013 was 80%. Obviously, we could not achieve that number. We couldn't make that number up. That's factual data. Your data is old. Do not make claims about what the board is not doing. You've never been to a board meeting. How would you know what the board is doing, Ms. Delaire? I appreciate and I am not criticizing your interest but the facts are that you are not reporting facts. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Lear.
What I just stated is from the Department of Education's report card for Plainfield High School. It is the recent one that is on the website. I am getting my information about these schools from the Department of Education. I spoke to the Union County Board of Education for two and a half hours the other day about Plainfield schools. I'm talking to educators, I'm talking to board members, I'm talking to Department of Education for New Jersey. I'm not making this up. I'm gathering things that are readily available. Okay, next question. Uh, the tutorial and academic programs don't always work. They appear to be uncoordinated and change on a whim, often losing our children because of these changes. How can you fix this? Mr. Rutherford. Well, um, obviously we need consistency in, in um, what's being taught. Um, the best way I could see of achieving this is to keep the progress we're going. I'm running with a slate of incumbents and a lot of times there's so much turnaround. Everyone complains about how there's so much turnaround on the board itself. But if we keep changing leadership, we keep not sticking with one team, um, changes from the top trickle down. Mr. Lear. I started teaching swimming when I was 16 years old. I was a state champion swimmer in school. And the thing I learned about children is consistency is exactly what they need to learn. You have to give them something the exact same way or sometimes a different way so that they actually understand what you're saying to them. If our programs aren't consistent, then we have to change that. We have to either make them consistent or we have to create a new program so these, these children can learn and give them what they need. Uh, inconsistency isn't acceptable. Mrs. Melgar. The question? Okay. The tutorial and academic programs don't always work. They appear to be uncoordinated and change on a whim, often losing our children because of these changes. How can you fix this? Um, I don't want to get enemies or anything like that. <laughs> because when I, I, I say something, they say, oh, don't say that because you're going to get enemies. Um, we have to, um, how can I say, we have to work to get together for our children. We have to do our best for them because uh, it's true, many people, they don't, many kids, they don't reach high school because uh, they don't have the motivation, they don't have the, the uh, they just don't, uh, we need to make something new for them. We need to, to work for them together. Mr. Moore. This might have been a past practice, but uh, since I've been on the board, I've, I've noticed the fact that the tutorial programs and the, the ancillary programs, if you will, are being coordinated, and they're being coordinated to the, to the point that we are moving toward a higher graduation level. We are moving toward a, a, a better, just general environment. So I, I would have to differ with the fact that the tutorial programs are held to scale because they are moving in a positive direction. Mrs. Campbell. We've actually done a better articulation between the community programs and the district in the past two years. What has happened is those community tutorial programs that have been identified have been funneled into the academic services department so that people who are offering tutorial services know exactly what's going on in the classroom. So is it tweaked to the nth degree? Probably not, but it's a lot better than it was because there is a connection between the community and the school district, and they're coordinating their efforts. Mrs. Clark. Could you repeat the question? Yes. yes. Uh, the the tutorial, tutorial and academic, academic programs, programs don't always work. They appear to be uncoordinated and change on a whim often losing our children because of these changes. How can you fix this? 
I feel as though you know, if you can set the if they be con con be consistent with the curriculum and start changing you know, all the children will learn. It's only because they keep moving it is why they're not learning and not taking it and, and taking it in. Um, and they stick to the program. Stick to the program and I believe that the children will learn and they will observe it. What is your top goal or priority if you are elected? Mrs. Campbell. If re-elected, <clears throat> my goal is for us to continue on the trajectory we've already started, and that is academic excellence for all of our students. Those who are interested in vocational areas to make sure that those opportunities are there, those who are interested in college, attending college, that those opportunities are there. I want to continue the successes that we've started support the administration and work collaboratively with our community. I would continue the progress that we've made. Mr. Moore. When I, when I decided that uh, this would probably be one of the things that I really wanted to do as, a, as something that I could give back to the community, I wanted to make sure, and I still want to make sure, that we have a STEM program, we have a STEM school, we have gifted and talented, a gifted and talented program, K to 12, in every one of the buildings in the, in the city. Now, I, I heard something about uh, uh, a curriculum and all, uh, curriculum changes and all the rest of those, that, that, that's another piece I'll talk about at another, big, another point in time. But I do want to have gifted and talented, K to 12, every building in our district. Mrs. Clark. I just wanted you to repeat the question. Yes, it's um, what is your top goal or priority if elected? If, if I'm elected, I can bring energy to the board. But my priority is that every student graduates from Plainfield High School. With the right curriculum and the right standards, they can do it. I don't want to be just a, a figurehead on the board. I want to be a, a board member doing the job and getting the work done. Mrs. Melgar. I have been challenged by my grandchildren. Uh, that motivates me to, to work very hard and every single student in, in the school system. And uh, I will do my best. And as I said, I'll, I'll put all my passion to do my best and to do with the team, to work, you know, as a, as a team together and, and to do the work that we have to do. Thanks. Mr. Lear. The first thing I would do is change this report card. This can't happen anymore. The second thing I would do is get us out of having priority schools or focus schools. They're not acceptable. I think the way we do that is we start at the top and we work our way down. We get our administration to evaluate our instructors and get our instructors on the right path so that our students get what they deserve. I am a great negotiator. I've sat on a lot of committees, as I said before. I am very willing to work with anyone who wants to make a difference in our town. Mr. Rutherford. I'll try to get two in one minute. Uh, the first one would be to continue the dual language program. Because of the fruits that being bilingual has brought to me, I think that it would, it would help all of our children, even after early childhood, if they were able to learn English and Spanish. The way it is now, there's people who learn who are learning English and ESL, and then English speakers. But with a few tweets, we can have all the students learning both languages. And, that, and people pay a lot of money for that service in more affluent communities. We can incorporate that into our school system at little to no extra cost, and uh, we ought to do it. And that brings us to our final portion of this part of the program, and that, are, that is the closing statements. Again, um, 
the order was uh, drawn and you have, uh, each candidate has two minutes for their closing. And Mr. Rutherford, you go first. Uh, as a lifelong Plainfield resident, I always knew the powers that be were arrogant and took us for granted. But I'm shocked by their audacity this time. They're running a slate of candidates who has attended zero board meetings. Uh, what do they think about us, the people of Plainfield? Uh, maybe it's tell a few lies at the, at the polls and they'll vote for anybody. Mr. Lear's beautiful Madison Avenue home is two blocks from Plainfield High School where meetings take place. If we take him by his word that he's been trying to run for the last two years, that means he's missed 48 meetings. Oh, in 48. Would you accept the PTO treasurer at Emerson who never been to a PTO meeting? How about church going folks? Would you want a deacon who's never attended a service? Um, when I get married someday, I want to hire a wedding planner who's been to a wedding. Look, it's laughable, and you're laughing because they haven't won. If they are allowed to win, this comedy becomes a tragedy. Because this isn't a wedding. This isn't even a church deacon or even a PTO treasurer. This is the entire school district of Plainfield. These are all of our children at stake. Um, so three years on the school board is a serious commitment that you can't just give away to people who've never been there before. In the interest of those children of, of whom I spoke, I strongly encourage you to vote 235, Keep Hope Alive, that's Campbell Moore Mrs. Clark. Mrs. Clark. Audience, please, we're getting to the close. Mrs. Clark. First, I would like to thank the Women League of Voters, and I thank every one of you for coming out. Thank you so much. If Richard Lear and Deborah Clark and Melgar, and Annabella Melgar is elected, we will be an advocate for your children. The state is high. The stakes are high. Our children's education is at risk. So we can no longer sit back and just accept things that they currently exist. We will work with the teachers towards the students' development and continue growing so they can achieve academic excellence. So now is the time to make a difference. Go and vote on the, for change on November the 5th. We must prepare them, our children talking about, for the future on November the 5th. Remember to vote for me, Deborah Clark, and my running mates, Annabella Melgar, Richard Lear. That is number one, four, and six on the ballot, and I thank you so much. Mr. Moore. Yes. I am committed to continue the forward-reaching educational goal of the Board of Education. Now, you hear me say forward-reaching educational goal. I'm not going to go backward and, and, and do some of the things that I've, I've heard. That goal is to move our students to be career ready so that they can make sure, so that they can be the leaders of the 22nd century. I will continue to promote advanced placement, upward bound affiliation, college association, uh, craft meetings, and I want to make sure that our students are advancing as well as they can and even beyond that. So what, what I'm asking for you to do is to make sure that you vote for a, a group of folks who understand what the educational process is. So I'm asking you to vote for two, three, and five when you vote on the 5th of November. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Melbar. Thank you so much for having us here. And uh, you all have sat here and listened to excuses, but we cannot longer accept excuses and alibis. We need to change the way we need to, to do things if we want our children to achieve. So if you want you ch change, vote for Annabella Melgar, number one, Richard, number four, and Barbara Clark. And I know these people are very genuine. I know them. Since the moment I spoke to them, and we gathered together for many um, uh, to study and to know what's going on, I know they are very genuine. 
Thanks so much, Mr. Weir. Since I moved to Plainfield, I've discovered a theme. People in power break the rules, the policies, or whatever, and then they say, oh, I didn't know, I'm so glad you told me, now I know I can do better. The comptroller of New Jersey said that the board hired a law firm without properly vetting them. The comptroller said in 2011 alone, that law firm charged $21,000 in fees for just opening files and $38,000 in fees for attending board meetings, which was in the retainer. It's not acceptable for this to go on. The comptroller also says that by hiring this law firm, Plainfield spends $71 per pupil in legal fees and the state averages $36 per pupil in legal fees. That's almost double. We can't accept this. You can't sit on the board for nine years, whatever, two years, and say, I don't know the policies. I've been studying them. I'm not a board member. No, I haven't been. I haven't had the ability at this time. I'm clearing my schedule so I can. I'm clearing my schedule so that I know the policies, I know the rules, I can work with people to make sure our children get an education. I don't think our existing board think our children are capable of what they really are capable of. I want them to have more. I want them to reach further. If you vote for Anna Bela Melgar, Deborah Clark, and Richard Lear, we will work diligently to make this happen. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Campbell. Thank you. Oh, Contrera, this board absolutely, positively has worked to push excellence in the district. You took me away from my prepared closing statement, but I'll go to that now. People, wake up. Our children are watching. Mr. Green and his trainers went out and recruited, handpicked this motley crew, and had the nerve to expect the voters of Plainfield to turn educating our children over to him. No way, absolutely no way. Our children are too important to be thrown to the wolves. Mr. Green's political style of pump them and dump them has no place in our educational arena. He clearly stated he runs slate so he can select the vendors of the district. Mr. Lear comes along identifying all the problems, no solutions. He's never attended a board meeting. We had a wonderful opening of our science labs last night. I didn't see one member of the green team. Yes, the dream team was in attendance. Mr. Mr. Lear, who identifies all these problems, stumbled into the last debate, which happened to have been in the fourth ward. Oh my God, nobody wants to go to the fourth ward, really? Well, one of the bloggers said that that was not a worthwhile debate. Why? Because it's in the fourth ward, stop. Many of our children reside in the fourth ward. Don't write them off. Look, on November 5th, there is a dream team for our children running. Two, three, and five, keep hope alive, bury the green team. Please give a round of applause to all the candidates. At this time, I would like to call up Mrs. Rivers, We were going to be having a, uh, a debate for the 4th Ward City Council, um, but unfortunately Mrs. Johnson is ill and unable to be here this evening. Based on our league rules, we will not have a debate just with one person, but uh, Mrs. Rivers will be able to give her opening statement and tell us uh, why we should vote for her for 4th Ward City Council. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I would first like to start off by saying thank you to the Plainfield League of Women Voters for hosting this debate. I am the councilwoman of the fourth ward and seeking re-election. I am the proud parent of three, the proud grandmother of two, and I am a lifelong member of the Mount Olive Baptist Church. 
I have served on the council for over three and a half years. I have also served on the Board of Education for over five years, where I served as past president and vice president. The fourth ward is one of the most diverse wards in Plainfield. It is an extremely unique ward with cultural and diversity. Under my presidency on the city council, I was able to work along with my constituents, the Union County Chairman, Assembly McGreen, the Union County Freeholder Chair, Linda Carter, to get $1 million that was owed to the city by the county. I was also with working with the chairman, the sheriff, and the, other sh the under sheriff, and John Luis, we were able to bring in the SLAP program to the city of Plainfield, a program which is in every town in Union County. But this year, we brought them right here to Plainfield to clean up the, to clean the city-owned vacant lots. We were also fortunate enough this year, with the help of our county chairman, Assembly McGreen, and Congressman Holt, to bring in federal, the federal government, FEMA, doing Superstorm Sandy, right here in the city of Plainfield, which serves well over 500 families. I was able to also get the chairman, along with the county manager and his staff, to take a bus tour through the city so we can get federal dollars to deal with some of the unfinished projects right here in the city of Plainfield. I can go on and on, but I will end by saying this. If I am re-elected to the Fourth Ward City Council, my phone will remain open 24-7. I will continue to work with the new administration to improve the overall vision and the quality of life in the city of Plainfield. Thank you for allowing me this time and have a great day. Uh, we're now going to take about a three minute break while we set up for our next uh, debate. <laughs>